Um, I'd, I'd like to say, um, you probably all know that you're a very uh, intelligent and discriminating audience, but, but I can tell you something else. You're also a very honest one, because I left my iPad on the chair after Joe's talk, and it was still there when I got back two hours later. So, <laughs> so to everyone who thought about stealing it but didn't, thank you very much. <laughs> Um, th this passage is um, uh, about uh, Roger Yount and his family. He's, um, as Bernd mentioned, he's a, a banker whose whole financial plan for the year has been based on needing a million pound bonus. And the character came from slightly like Zbigniew of the Builder. I, the, the germ that led to him was hearing about sort of normal looking people who lived in areas like ours who, in a good year, this was, again, around the turn of the century. He, you know, in the, he got paid a million pounds last year, he said to me, pointing to someone in the street. And so I started thinking about that, thinking about what it would be like to be that person. What would it be like if that were you? And, and Roger really is someone who grew out of that thought because um, you know, I think what would happen was on, the, on Monday, when you were told about your potential million pound bonus, you'd think, that's the most amazingly, excitingly wonderful thing that's ever happened in history. By about Wednesday, you start to think, you know, yeah, that's normal, a million pounds, yeah, you know, I'm worth it, that's what I get. And by about Friday, you'd convince yourself that you actually need the money. And, and Roger's, Roger is that person, He's, he genuinely thinks he needs the money. And, that's, and he hasn't got it, that's the first thing you need to know. Uh, he hasn't got it, and he hasn't told his family yet. Um, and the second thing you need to know is that his wife, Arabella, has been, we know, we the reader know that she has been preparing an unpleasant surprise, but we don't know what it is. And so this is Roger going home on Christmas Eve. Hanging from a strap on the Jubilee line as he went home on Christmas Eve, Roger thought about when might be the best time to tell Arabella about his non-existent bonus. Arabella was good at making life seem easy, except when she suddenly and dramatically wasn't. Roger had an intuition, this might be one of those times. It would have been better to have done it already, obviously. But on Friday, he'd just been too numb, too freaked, too incredulous, too sick. He was in no condition to have a long talk about his missing million pounds. And anyway, by the end of the day, the impulse to blurt everything out had long since faded. A lesser man, Roger felt, would have gone home straight after being sick in the office. Roger was made of sterner stuff. And anyway, what would he have done if he'd gone home? Sit there blubbing and moping and waiting for Arabella to get back from the shops? No. He sucked it up, took it like a man, and spent the day hiding in his office and pretending to work. <laughs> Not that much work got done on 21st December at the bank as the compensation committee broke its news. Every now and then, he would peek through the window and survey the scene in the trading room. The noise was about a quarter its usual level. People were just sitting there. One or two of them had their heads in their hands. Some others just stood around in a demoralised little huddle. They looked like refugees or something. Sad. So sad. It was like... Roger stretched to find some metaphor for the scale of the grief, the comprehensiveness of the disaster being in some shithole in Iraq or somewhere where some yank pilot has dropped a bomb on you by mistake. <laughs> everything's blown into pieces, there are bits everywhere, body parts, limbs, blood, everything. And it's not your fault. That was the key thing, not your fault. He hadn't done anything wrong. But they went and dropped the bomb anyway. Those bloody yanks. Anyway, Friday had been too soon, and there hadn't really been an opportunity over the weekend. It was the sort of news you had to steel yourself to break. You had to create a pause around the moment, and there just hadn't been a chance. Ara Arabella had been out on Saturday, and he'd had a lie-in, and then pottered about while the weekend nanny took Joshua and Conrad. Then he'd gone to the gym in the afternoon, and they'd had a takeaway after the kids were in bed. But by then, things had felt too chilled out to spoil the mood. And then on Sunday, they had a brunch date at the country club, and it had slid into the afternoon. And Roger had been first buzzed from a couple or even three Bloody Marys, and then had been coming down from the buzz. 
and the day had somehow just gone. And now it was Monday, Christmas Eve, and there was no way this could possibly be the right time, could it? To tell your wife you'd underperformed your own expectations, which Roger had mentioned to Arabella one night a couple of months ago, a mistake he couldn't resist making to see the glint come into her eye, at some point when his marital share price had otherwise been rather low, but to tell your wife you'd underperformed your expectations by a cool £970,000, that wasn't the sort of gift you gave on Christmas Eve. Roger wasn't a monster. <laughs> what with all the whatever, he'd barely had time to think about it being Christmas. At least he had sorted out Arabella's present, some fancy sofa she'd had her eye on, which would be, this was the punchline, delivered on Christmas Day itself. The people at the furniture company, the delivery people anyway, worked on Christmas so you could have your present right there when you wanted it, with none of that rubbish about waiting two weeks for the delivery. Fair enough, if you were spending ten grand on a sofa, you could at least get the arsing thing delivered when you actually wanted, even if it was Christmas. The thing was to let Christmas be Christmas, not to turn it something into something out of a depressing thing. It's a wonderful life without the happy ending. It's a shit life and we're suddenly poor. No, don't tell her on Boxing Day either, obviously. The plan was to go down to their country house on the 27th and stay into the new year, have a few chums down for a party and a sleepover on New Year's Eve. That might be the time to do it, in Wiltshire. Have a bit more perspective when out of London. Arabella would be knackered from looking after the children. She'd already warned him it would be just the two of them doing childcare over the holiday, which would mean she'd be grumpy, but on the other hand, she'd also be busy with the boys and that would help keep her distracted. OK, so that was the plan. Tell her on the 27th in the country. Maybe go for a walk and tell her. He'd be carrying Joshua in a papoose on his back, which would make it hard for her to shout at him. As always, when he made a plan, Roger felt better. He trotted up the stairs at the tube and came out into the dark of Christmas Eve. The high street was mayhem. Half the people there doing last-minute Christmas shopping, the other half determined to start the first evening of the holiday pissed. The bars were heaving. Roger dodged drunks and shoppers. Church bells were ringing. For a moment, Roger thought about rounding everybody up at home and dragging them to the service of lessons and carols. That wasn't really them, was it? Plus, Josh would already be in bed. No. Shower, change, glass of champagne. They might even have sex. When it was a holiday, Arabella sometimes let him. <laughs> Roger was home. The front door bumped against Pilar's bag. That's right, she was off to whichever Latin country it was she was from, uh, Colombia or something. At the other end of the open plan ground floor, the television was showing one of Conrad's Japanese-looking cartoon series. He would be sitting in front of the screen with his thumb in his mouth. Pilar materialised by the door. She seemed in something of a rush. Mr Young, thank you, I go now, she said. Josh, he upstairs, already in bed. Great, fabulous, thank you so much. Happy Christmas, said Pilar. Goodbye. And she was gone. That was as Roger's conversations with her went, on the long side. Weeks went by without his seeing Pilar at all. He went through into the sitting room. Sure enough, Conrad was sucking his thumb and watching people fighting on rocket-powered sky cycles. Arabella wasn't with him, so she must be upstairs, perhaps settling Josh in bed or on the phone making plans for the new year. Daddy's just going to have a quick shower, said Roger. His son made no sign of having heard. From the noise and general sense of dramatic urgency, Roger gathered that this was a crucial moment in the story. He went upstairs, undressed, ran the shower till it was hot and the room was half full of steam, and then got in. He felt his muscles unknot, and some of the horror of the bonus question melt away. It was Christmas, family time, quality time. The thing was to enjoy it. Yes. Roger felt better when he was completely clean, so he shampooed his hair and shaved, both for the second time that day, then dressed in his non-going-out slouchy trousers and went downstairs. Conrad was now watching a different but extremely similar mock Japanese cartoon. Time for a glass of Bollinger. There was an envelope on the table in Arabella's large, looping, very feminine handwriting. 
Roger picked it up. Dear Roger, you stupid, spoilt, selfish shit, I have gone away for a few days. So that you get a glimpse of what it is like to be me, you spoilt, lazy, arrogant, stuck-up, typical male bastard. You have no idea what it's like to look after the children, and you have no idea what the last couple of years have been like, so this is now your chance to try it and see. Pilar has gone, and the nanny agencies will be shut for the next few days at least. Congratulations. You are on your own looking after your two boys. As for where I've gone, that's none of your fucking business. <laughs> but I will be back, and when I am, I'll expect to see some changes in your attitude and in what you actually do. None of that coming home from work acting like you're the one who's had a difficult time of it. Welcome to my life. And if I ever get so much as a glimpse of competitive tiredness from you ever again, I'll be leaving permanently. Or rather, you will, and I will leave you to guess who will get the house and the children. <laughs> Fuck off, <laughs> Arabella. <laughs> it wouldn't be true to say that Roger saw the funny side <laughs> or had glimpses of perspective or anything like that. But there, one, there were one or two moments on Christmas morning when he, he was able to remember that things hadn't always been like this. At about quarter to seven, for instance, he was downstairs on the sitting room carpet trying to assemble a plastic robot which turned into a car and also into a gun and uttered set phrases through a speaker box and could be operated by remote control. The problem was that it was a very complicated toy. Not only was it highly fiddly with hundreds of small parts, but it came with instructions which seemed designed with the conscious intention to confuse and mislead. Beside and around and beneath Roger, the floor was covered in pieces of infant Lego from several different kits, which Conrad had torn open and throw, thrown around the room when his back was turned. Joshua had upended the gigantic box of Brio he'd been given, so a substrate of wooden train tracks and engines lay mixed in with the plastic, paper, torn boxes, and various other toys which had been briefly experimented with and already discarded. Conrad had already broken one of his main toys, a racing car with green stripes and a driver who was supposed to beep when you pressed down on his head, but who'd been jammed down so firmly he didn't stop beeping, like an alarm. Roger hadn't been able to find either an off switch or a battery hatch to open, so he'd smashed the toy with a hammer. <laughs> Conrad was still sniffling about that, while fiddling with one of his new lightsabers. No, Roger had not seen the funny side. But there had been a moment when, after looking at his watch, he had thought, I can remember when Christmas would start at about half past ten with a glass of Buck's Fizz in bed. Now it begins at half past five with a test of my fine motor skills and ability to translate Korean. <laughs> there was no sense in which Roger had taken things lying down. The previous night, straight away on getting the note, he had bundled a protesting Conrad off to bed, then hit Google and looked up nanny agencies, not omitting things like emergency nannies, last-minute nannies, and crisis nannies. <laughs> he left messages on the answering machine of seven different agencies and knew that he was going to hire the very first person who was available. So help was at hand. But help being at hand was no help, not right here in the here and now. After leaving his nanny messages, Roger had held the phone in his hand for a long time. The question was what message to leave on Arabella's mobile. He knew her well enough to know she wouldn't answer it, or even have it switched on. He also knew that she'd be checking messages, desperate to know how the plan had gone. His first impulse was to ring up and rant, denounce, deplore, ask her who she thought she was, how lazy she was, how little clue she had, Oh, and by the way, they were £970,000 short. <laughs> to tell her not to bother coming back, to tell her the locks would be changed, that all further contact would be through solicitors, that her children now hated her and more of the same. Roger also knew that she would be expecting, and to some extent depending, on a reaction along these lines. He had a simple maxim for all adversarial situations. Work out what the other party least wants you to do, and then do it. Relieving your feelings would be fun, but the best course of action was to make things as difficult as possible for the person trying to make things difficult for you. 
on that basis, the thing that would most freak Arabella out was for him to be cool, to act as if nothing had happened. Nothing could have discon disconcerted him less. She'd be lying, she would be relying on drama, on fuss. OK, fine. He'd give her the, he would give her the silent treatment. Knowing Arabella, she would have gone to some posh spa or hotel. Well, she could stew there. He'd be fine with the boys. How hard could it be? Now, on Christmas morning, as if to answer that question, Joshua, who had insisted on having his nighttime nappy taken off, was making it clear he needed to go, go to the toilet, which he did by pointing to the sitting room and roaring. Roger picked him up with his right hand, carried him up to the half landing, and opened the loo door with his left. There should have been a potty, but there wasn't. The last thing Pilar did when she left on the weekend was to disinfect the loos and let the potties and leave them to dry, but Roger didn't know that. So he tried to hold Joshua in place in, on the toilet seat and keep him falling, from falling into the toilet bowl while his son did whatever he had to do. Joshua seemed to object to that procedure. <laughs> he didn't like being held up with his, in the air with his bum over the seat. <laughs> There's nothing else for it, said Roger. Joshua twisted his upper body and tried to bite Roger on the arm. Would you rather I let you fall in, said Roger. The answer seemed to be in the affirmative. <laughs> Joshua now began wriggling from side to side as hard as he could with the full unrestrained strength of a three-year-old. He had concentrated force of will and was also stockular, musky, mus stocky, muscular, a tube of force and determination. He suddenly changed direction and bucked upward, catching Roger right on the point of the chin with a ferocious upward headbutt. <laughs> Fuck, said Roger, his eyes stinging with tears. As his grip weakened, he let, he let Joshua slip. The little boy fell on the loose seat, seeming to be in tears, before he landed on the floor. At that point, with no warning, he began to shit. A spray of excrement, not entirely liquid in texture, but not solid either, came out of Joshua's bum as if it was a form of propellant. He began crawling at an amazing speed out of the loo, heading for the landing. Roger, head ringing, one hand on his mouth and jaw, lunged after him, but he was too slow, and Joshua made it onto the cream carpet before his father could catch him. Excrement was still coming out of Joshua's bottom, and he was crying still. Roger was crying too, thanks to the headbutt, which had made his eyes fill with tears. He lunged and grabbed Josh with his right arm before he could make it down the stairs. Roger, wrestling his son, noticed something that it was not helpful to notice. The colour of the fresh shit squirrels on the carpet was exactly the shade of a perfectly made cappuccino. Then Joshua shat again this time down the arm of Roger's dressing gown. It was liquid and hot. It smelt very, very bad. Then the front door rang. <laughs> Fuck, said Joshua, Roger, under his breath, but not sufficiently under his breath because Josh, smiling now that he'd relieved himself, also said, Fuck. <laughs> Roger decided whoever was at the door could sod off. He took Josh back into the loo and put him standing up in the sink. Then he shrugged off his dressing gown thinking, that's for the bin. Then he ran the taps and washed Joshua, who was clean from the waist up, but below that was about 70% covered in shit. While he was doing this, the doorbell rang twice more, each time for longer. Roger put Josh down and looked in the cupboard under the sink, where there were about seven or eight different kinds of cleaner, none of them self-evidently the one to get shit off a carpet. There was something called carpet shampoo. Roger knew about that. That would be the stuff but none of these things would admit to being carpet shampoo. While he was looking at various aerosol sprays, Roger, Joshua picked up the bleach and tried to get the top off. Then when his father took it away from him, made a lunge for the air freshener, knocked the top off before Roger could react, sprayed himself in the face at a range of three inches and burst into tears again. Then the doorbell rang for the fifth time. Who rang the bell like that on Christmas Day, for God's sake? Roger put his dressing gown back on, tried to avoid handling the stripes of shit on the left arm, picked up his naked son and went downstairs to open the door. Three very large men, all of them at least Roger's height, stood there with a huge package wrapped in cardboard. Happy Christmas, the largest of the large men said in a South African accent. We have a delivery for Mrs. Yant. He lowered his voice to a loud whisper. It's the sofa. 
fuck, said Joshua. <laughs>